So I'd also show 99, 300 grand in passive income from one idea. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. Hey, what's going on? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. This is episode 99, $300,000 in passive income from one idea. Pretty crazy show for you today. You know, in, in the business world, there's this concept that ideas on their own are pretty much worthless and execution is all that matters. And I'm sure you've heard guests on this show echo that. You've probably heard me say that. But today, we're going to challenge that notion in a big, big way. My guest is Nate Dallas um, from natedallas.com. He's actually a dentist by day, uh, so he's still a side hustler, but pretty serious uh, side hustler at that. Um, and on this call, we're going to take a deep dive into the world of product licensing. Now, if you're not familiar with how licensing works, like I wasn't, it's how you can sell your ideas to big companies and collect royalties, uh, sometimes for years after the fact, um, on, on sales that, that they make. Um, all <laughs> Definitely uh, an interesting one. All my notes and highlights from the call, plus Nate's top product licensing tips, are available to you in a free downloadable PDF at SideHustleNation.com slash 99 or through the link in the episode description of your podcast player app. News and updates before we get into it. The Side Hustle Show has been nominated Best Business Podcast at next month's Podcast Awards at New Media Expo. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your nominations. And now it's time to cast your vote. <laughs> I'm, I, I say it because I'm up against some pretty stiff competition. But if you do think that the show is worthy, head over to podcastawards.com, drop in uh, a vote for the little old side hustle show, and it would take, you know, probably take 30 seconds or so. You can do it from your phone. Very much appreciated. You can actually vote one time every 24 hours between now and March 24th. So uh, I appreciate every everyone who takes the time to do that. Thank you so much. Again, podcastawards.com, and, uh, and thank you for that. Now, let's get into it with Nate. Hey, Nate, what's going on? Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm glad to be here. You are tasked with, uh, <laughs> with, the, with the challenge of teaching uh, me and everyone listening about product licensing. And I guess we should take it back to your, to your first deal uh, with, with Mattel. And this happened while you, were in, while you were in grad school, while you were at dental school? That's right. Yeah, I, uh, I've always been a product maker uh, a lot of things over the years and most of those were small scale things that I could produce myself and sell myself and uh, when I was in dental school after after undergrad I got my marketing degree and moved on to become a super nerd in uh, in grad school and I realized that time was really really a value valuable commodity that was disappearing and so I was sleeping about four hours a night and staying up late studying and all the time in the lab and this and that. So I knew that if I was going to make money on a product, somebody else was going to have to do some of the work. And so I started reading books about licensing and figuring out how those deals work. And um, oddly enough, my first try worked. And so uh, my family's always played a lot of board games and party games and stuff like that. And uh, there's probably two places you have no business making a product. One is mobile apps and the other is board games because uh, the competition is just insane. But I did it anyway. And um, so my brother and I made a game and decided to pitch it and, and, you know, go from there. So we pitched it to a small company in New Jersey that makes a lot of games. And they said, you can come and pitch, but don't expect a deal. We look at about 100 submissions a year. Okay. And we pick up two of those. So your odds are not good, but if you want to fly to New Jersey, we'll give you 10 minutes. Okay. So, so I put my brother on the plane because I was studying and paid for his ticket and said, go show him what we got. We had a cardboard prototype uh, with very uh, rudimentary game pieces that were all homemade. And he went and pitched it. And he called me back and said, they just offered us a 7% deal 
they want to start producing this. And I said, do not sign anything. <laughs> Get on the airplane and come home because I think we may have something here. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so then I had to do some research on what what makes a good deal for licensing. And I said, well, I want to show it to some bigger companies just to see because the small people were that quick to jump on it. You know, there may be a chance. So I looked at Hasbro and Mattel as a big dreamer, and neither one of them would talk to me. And so they said, we have a list of agents you can use. If you can convince one of them that this is a good idea, we'll talk to them. And so I did that. And then the agent pitched it. And then the agent called me and said, you have an offer. Wow. So this was a good, is this, is this a game that somebody would have heard of? Uh, not in the United States. It was produced in 30 countries overseas. What they did was took a game that was uh, totally original that we made, and they wanted to attach a, a recognizable brand name to it, so they called it Pictionary Mania. Pictionary has been around for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, and that brand was kind of dying, so they wanted something to put behind it to revitalize it to a younger audience. So that's what they did. Uh, it was never produced in the United States because of some legal problems with uh, all the other licensing way before I ever entered the picture with Pictionary and whatnot. I don't know. Okay. But anyway, so, uh, but I asked the agent, I said, look, I've got a 7% offer from this company. Mattel only offered me three. Uh, you know, what do you think? And he said, you're an idiot if you go with this smaller company because M- Mattel is going to sell so many more. They're going to sell 50 times more games. Don't get caught up on the percentage take the money and run. They're going to pay you $10,000 for an advance just for signing the deal. And to me, at that point in my life, I was pumped with just that. Even if they never left the floor with it, if it never shipped, I'm going to make $10,000. So uh, so I signed that deal. And the agent was right because they went on to sell $10 million worth of copies of that game. And at 3% royalty, that means the home team... Uh, brought home three hundred thousand dollars. Three hundred grand in in I'll call it passive income from this one this one idea flying to New Jersey on a on a whim, getting that initial offer, having the guts to say no, we might be onto something, pitching the bigger company and and having them take it to market in thirty countries. Um, th- that's crazy. So let's let's back it up. You start said you started off by reading a couple books. Uh, on licensing, can you remember the the titles? Any recommended reading on that front? Uh, no, you know it's been so long ago. Uh, I, I really don't even know titles, but I read every book I could find about uh, game making and licensing and game design and that sort of stuff, and just a lot of online material, of course. But um, I mean, it really is crazy, and that's a long shot. I mean, I've had a, several other deals since then um, that were much smaller, much more reasonable. This is not a common thing that happens. I really got lucky. Timing was good, and I know that. This is not because I'm some genius. Uh, <laughs> you know, th- this was really good timing, but it really woke me up to realize, you know, this is a viable option for passive income. And as a person who thinks of new products literally weekly, I just thought, holy moly, this is going to be so much fun. I'm going to do this forever. <laughs> Forever. Let's talk about the like the the protection of the idea because you know I one of them would be I'm going to go and and pitch this company like why do I have any like patent protection or ownership or like why did they cut you a ten thousand dollar check instead of saying oh thanks that's that's a great idea why don't we just go make that our own because they're question. going to be doing all the work anyways right. Right, which is the beauty of it. Uh, well, so there, that's kind of a loaded question because that to answer that question, it totally depends on the product. You know, some products need to be patented. Some, you don't even have a working prototype or a finalized design to patent yet. Then there's some things like a board game where you couldn't patent if you wanted to. You can trademark names. You can do copyrights on content or whatever. But initially, what you're offering is your IP And the only way really to protect that uh, on a deal like that is through non-disclosure agreements, which are a very common standard thing. Any company you go to is probably 
uh, they have one in house that they already use. And and what that agreement is is saying, as of this date, we're going to discuss an idea that relates to this, and you be as descriptive as you can without giving it away, uh, or out or without taking a risk on on that IP. And you have your discussion, and at the end of that discussion, they need to disclose to you if they're already working on something like that and prove to you that they are. And if not, uh, if they went on to do it, you could have a legitimate lawsuit that they stole the idea. Okay, okay. Um, so that the NDA, the non-disclosure agreement, is enough for most cases. Now, if you have something really, really awesome, if you figured out a flashlight that cures cancer, you need to spend $10,000 and get a patent before you talk to anyone. But uh, I probably take more risk than a lot of people because I try so many things. Um, but the everybody's paranoid about an idea getting stolen. The truth of it is, is it doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, These companies, you know, they, unless it's something that they really, really want, um, you know, they're probably not going to give you the time of day anyway. But if it is something they want and something that you have documented and you have proof, you know, your computer files, your letters you've sent, everything, you know, they know they're going to get sued if if they violate that non-disclosure agreement. So they just don't do it. So don't let that stop you because the even if someone does do a spinoff of it or whatever, your other option is to do nothing. And I promise you're not going to make any money doing that. Okay. So, you know, these, this, is like the, this is the trend. So we, we play Monopoly Deal a lot and there's like Scrabble Slam and there's like this dictionary spinoff you're talking about. So there's, yeah, there's like revitalizing these board games into, uh, you know, something smaller, maybe a little, let, a little bit faster gameplay and stuff. Right. Well, the brand is worth something and, uh, and millions and millions of dollars have been spent on those brands and they want to keep those alive and they know that, you know, if the brand's on it, they're probably going to sell some. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How about the the agent? So if the so you guys went through the uh, the Mattel recommended agent or one of their recommended agents, I imagine that he or she gets a cut as well. Yes, and any good agent uh, will work on commission only. So if you contact a quote unquote agent, a licensing agent, and there's a lot of them out there, and there's a lot of sharks out there, um, sharks in a bad way. Um, you really don't need to pay up front for anything. You don't need to get in over your head with promises and, you know, whatever. Anybody who knows what they're doing and is good at what they're doing will say, you only pay me if I get you a deal. And okay. then they want, that can be structured however. Sometimes that's in perpetuity forever. Um, I've had some deals where it's a three-year thing, somewhere it's a 10-year tapering thing. You know, that's all negotiable with you. And, and the agent, but, um, mm. you so know, being, you, an, being, if you don't have the product idea, being the agent could be an interesting side hustle too. Uh, it would be fun. You got to have a lot of contacts and you got to, uh, you know, that that's what you're paying for. They, they have the relationships with certain companies and they can walk in and talk to the guy that you can't talk to. So if you know that company XYZ would be the perfect target for your, for your product idea, do you specific, I mean, do you reach out to them first directly? Like just like cost page on their website, like, or do you try and find an agent that specializes in either that type of product or that industry to, to see if you can get your foot in the door? Well, there's a lot of ways to go about it. I mean, you laugh about just hitting the contact page. You would not believe the conversations that I have um, by going going it alone and and literally starting there. LinkedIn is my absolute goldmine for contact stuff. I mean, you can you are two connections away from any CEO in the country, really, uh, on LinkedIn. If you get on there, you you pull up. Just say you want to reach. I don't know. Give me a company, anybody. Um, how about was, how about Disney? Okay, so Disney. So you want to produce uh, cotton candy that you want to sell to Disney? Well, there is a buyer for Disney that specializes in park food. I'm certain. <laughs> okay, okay. I've developed a, a way to make cotton candy in the shape of a Mickey Mouse head. Okay, and, and I've got to feed, I've got to reach the buyer for park food. Okay. So if you went on to LinkedIn and you typed Disney buyer food, you're probably going to find somebody who knows who to talk to. If you had to back up a step and you just did Disney buyer, 
or Disney food services. I don't know. But you're going to get a list of people. They may not accept your invite, but it's worth a try. And if they accept it, then you just say, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Who should I talk to? And you're respectful of their time and you keep it short and brief. Never pretend like you're bigger than you are or you're somebody that you are not. You say, hey, I'm a side hustler with no credentials to do this. I have no idea who I'm supposed to talk to, but I think that you probably know. Can you point me in the right direction? And I'm going to say 20% of the time that works. And uh, so all you have to do is do that with five people and somebody's going to ping you back. Okay. Okay. That's not the, you know, that's not a bad odds, I guess. No. And, and I mean, it's, and it's all there. It's so great. So there's a lot of conversations I have now with distributors, with manufacturers, with uh, big companies that I want to talk about licensing. And it all starts with a simple email or a simple uh, ping on LinkedIn or whatever. But the other thing I want to say is do not discount the value of a real phone call. You can call the receptionist, whatever phone number they have there. And if you can charm him or her, they will help you. And I don't mean like kissing butt and, you know, what I mean, just being a genuine person, make them laugh and say, I know this is nuts. I know this is not the number I'm supposed to call, but who am I supposed to talk to for this? And man, I'm telling you, people love to help an honest person who's trying to do something, you know? So, uh, it's it's easier than uh, than you think it is to get to get a conversation. OK, OK. Can we can we I, I have a question for you because you're right. you're a dentist by day like this is your full time. You own the dental practice. You're an entrepreneur. Um, you know, every you, it's, it's a lucrative it's a lucrative job. It's you know, you already kind of have the, the time freedom of, you know, being your own boss in a sense. So like why why side hustle? Why continue to to do this stuff when by a lot of accounts, you're already, you know, living the the entrepreneurial dream. Oh man, there's so many different answers to that question. <laughs> uh, but I'll give you a few. Um, uh, let's face it, the world takes a lot of money, and um, so one simple answer is I really want to make a lot of it. Uh, <laughs> okay. And that you know, I mean, how simple can you get? But but that's an honest answer. That's one. Um, the other is. This was all part of a plan for me to have a good job that I can make a lot of money doing, eventually own, make my own schedule so that I can do all the side stuff that I really love to do. It's just like your slogan, you know, uh, nine to five makes you a living, but the five to nine keeps you alive. That is my life. I mean, I, I work four days a week. I make a bunch of money at my job. And then all of the other time is my passion, my hobby, my stuff that I really love. But the job gives me the security to not only fail, um, but to really be tempered in the approach. Because when you're desperate, you make stupid decisions. When you're emotional, when you're stressed out, when stuff at home is crazy, you make bad decisions. And if your side hustle is your main hustle and it has to work, you're going to make a lot of mistakes when you could really sit back take a deep breath, recalculate, pivot, regroup. And so I think there's a lot of security um, that plays into good decision making. And, you know, a lot of it just takes a lot of projects. I was listening to uh, James Altucher not too long ago, and he, he was, you know, he's brutally honest about stuff. But I think he said of his last 100 projects, 98 of them failed. Okay. Uh, but he can do that, you know, because he has – other streams of income. And so, you know, a big part of it for me is don't, don't kill the cash cow, let it do what it does so that all the other stuff can happen. And I eventually want to retire from dentistry. Uh, my goal is to retire at 40, which is way earlier than most dentists do. But, um, that's my personal plan. That's been my plan from the get go. And some of these things are now growing big enough to where I could make a living off of it. But, I'm not ready to kill the cow yet. That's exciting. How old are you now? 
34. All right. You count the countdown is on. I'm excited for you. Oh, yeah. I think I'm going to be uh, slipping back into my, my southern draw by the end of this call. <laughs> I, 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 live, I lived in Atlanta for a year and a half or so, and I definitely picked one up to the point where I would go back home for, for Thanksgiving to Seattle, and my family would be like, where did you come from? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know, uh, we, we consider Atlanta – you know, I mean, that's basically like New York, uh, mm-hmm. where we are. <laughs> you got to get below Macon to get really Southern. But that that's the problem with podcasting with a guy from South Georgia. Uh, what normally would be a 45-minute interview takes two hours because of the draw. <laughs> yeah, crank, the, crank this one up to 1.5 or 2x. Yeah, yeah, already. right. Get the chipmunk version. But uh, uh, one other thing, though, about that last question is diversity, uh, diversification of your portfolio you know, I, I hope everybody that's listening to this tries more stuff and adds more things to their basket because there's real security in that when one thing's kind of struggling, something else is picking up. But if there's, if there's 12 things in that basket that all produce some income, life is just so much better. Definitely, definitely. I've you know, learned the diversification thing uh, the hard way on, on a couple occasions, so I definitely can advocate for that. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And the, the other thing with it, uh, if I can stay on the same question for even longer, uh, I think that for me, I've really learned that this is who I am. This is what I do. Um, I don't think I can sit and do one thing um, for any length of time. I need this other stuff in my life. It is my recreation, like in the true sense of recreation, like recreates me um, and it makes everything else work better. Uh, and I, I don't know how many people have the same disorder that I have where you have to be moving and working on 10 things at once to be happy. But if that's you, I'll, ra- I'll, raise, that. my hand. I'll raise my hand to that. Yeah. But I mean, do that. Like God made you that way. You can't change it. You, if you don't do it, you're going to wish you were doing it and then you're miserable and then you're mean to your wife and you kick your dog and whatever. Just do the side hustle. Yeah, I think of like my friend Julian Gordon has a exercise he calls your perfect average day. And so we just got back from Hawaii. It was awesome. It was great. It was fun. But like there was not like my perfect average day includes at least some productivity, some work. Like I'm working on some project I care about some. And I didn't have a lot of that. And and it was almost like I don't want to say I was frustrated. I want to say like I was ungrateful to have this opportunity, this vacation. But like. You, you, I can only lie on the beach for so long, you know, and, and I get the sense that, and I think that's probably the case for most people. Like you, yeah. you, you need to be working on something that, you know, that you have some ownership in that you're driving forward. And, and that's what the, that's what the side hustle comes in. Okay. Yeah. Let's get back to the, um, the, the licensing stuff is the, the idea thing, like any hacks for coming up with ideas. Like, I'm, I mean, you know, you're either, you're either in the boat of like, ideas come to you every day or in the middle of the night in the shower or if i only had the one million dollar idea i you know then everything would be great um yeah so what's what's your take on that um well i really honestly think everybody has million dollar ideas i think very few people do anything but i mean if you pay attention to conversations that everybody in your family and all of your friends have it's i wish somebody would make of this or you know this would make it so much easier to do this task or whatever. Necessity is the mother of all invention, right? So, I mean, every day we're encountering things that are problems that need solutions. Um, so who's going to who's gonna come up with the solution? Why not you? Um, so I, I do think everybody has good ideas, but there are certain places where it just seems to work better. I, I do a lot of traveling to speak. Uh, at mostly dental conferences and mastermind meetings and things like that. And I don't know what it is about travel, but I can zone out for a few minutes. I don't have to deal with anybody that I know. And for a day and a half, I can be alone and listen to an audio book, read three magazines, do the stuff I can't normally do because I'm so busy. And that's really where I get a lot of my new ideas, Um, just getting in a different place, getting you know, out of the normal routine. I spend a lot of time in the woods. I like, I like to hunt and fish and that sort of stuff. And that's more of a, just a break, give a a mental break, but Mm -hmm. I'm not generating ideas out there. That's more of my retreat. I need three hours to do that. And then I'm back. But 
But I don't know. Other than that, I think it's being around creative people. Um, I'm a big fan of mentors. I'm a big fan of mastermind groups. Everybody in your life who is doing something of value uh, has something they can teach you. And, you know, how to get into those groups, uh, you know, is probably different for everybody. But um, I think you just have to be around creativity and those kind of people. And if you don't have those people, you need to be consuming content somewhere, um, you know, to know what's going on in the world. But um, I don't know. I'm I'm a problem solver. I'm a lateral thinker. And I'm um, I'm crazy enough to try just about anything. I like it. any uh, examples outside of this board game of, of other products that you've licensed that maybe on the problem solving side, like a physical product. Yeah, I've got, um, well, in my profession, I've, I've discovered a, a technique for, um, giving injections to children, which is a difficult thing to do. Um, so I've developed a device that will do that painlessly and they have no idea they're getting a shot, um, okay. which is usually the thing that'll kill you because if they see it, <laughs> man, you're toast. You are dead in the water. Um, I can give it, I can give them a shot with a regular syringe without them feeling it. But if they see it, man, it's, it's game over. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, I remember sitting I in that dentist chair. <laughs> oh yeah, man. And, and if, and if you've ever been to a bad dentist as a child, then, Oh God, people You're carry that into, yeah, it's forever. Like you can't reel it back in. You have to drug people to get them to come in. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so that's one thing that I'm, there's a, a major, uh, medical manufacturer now that's got this product in review. I'm about to have a 3d printed prototype made so that I can actually try it on my own children. <laughs> oh geez. Uh, <laughs> they're, uh, they're, they're the brave guinea pigs of this. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, I don't think I can legally test it on humans, um, you know, that, that don't belong to me. But <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's one. I've got a, um, I talked about the hunting and fishing thing. I've, I've got a, a product that I'm working on right now for feeding wildlife. I mean, it sounds so ridiculous. I mean, board games and dentistry and now a deer feeder. But I've there's a real problem with every feeder that's on the market and a solution that I've come up with that I think, it's going to work. So that's in the works. Um, no, you, you said about 3d printing for this other thing. Like I have no, I have like, this is how uncrafty I am or unhandy. Like I have no idea where to start to physically like make a thing, like to go to the garage and like start whittling. Like wh- <laughs> where, do, where do you, do you find a 3d printer? Like, do you do this yourself? Like how are you building like the board game thing? Okay. Cardboard and whatever, but like, you know, something as, as high tech as a medical syringe. Well, it's just like, Oh, come on, man. You, you'd figure it out. Uh, <laughs> Okay, do you know how to make logos and design websites and all that stuff? Uh-huh. See, so digi- digital creation, okay. Okay, so but but if you need a logo, you can go to 99designs and pay 300 bucks and somebody will build you one, you know, it, or Fiverr or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, this exists across all platforms. I mean, there's somebody that knows how to do the 3D modeling. There are crowdsourced places where you can get somebody to do that. I've get uh, I get mock-ups all the time done on Fiverr for 10 bucks of new ideas so that I can pitch them, you know, before a prototype's ever made. But, you know, then there's design houses that will, you know, you actually have real engineers that know what they're doing. Uh, so the mock-up is somebody, together. is just somebody doing like the CAD design for it or something? Yeah, or even just 2D uh, originally. Okay. But, um, but beyond that, I mean... I mean, you'd laugh at how rudimentary some of the stuff is, but like you can make prototypes out of anything, uh, depending on w- what the function is. But you could go buy foam at Michael's store that people use to stuff flowers in and cut it into a physical product if you needed to, you know, or make it out of clay or play doh or whatever. <laughs> but you know, at some point, it becomes more technical, and you probably need help. But uh, I don't do 3D printing at home yet, but I am teaching my children <laughs> how to do 3D modeling, and I do want to buy a desktop unit so that uh, so that they could do that stuff. But um, but I mean, there's a resource for everything, and everybody's so connected now. It would take you five minutes online to find uh, a, a legitimate company to build anything. 
that that you could think of. But the the key is do it on something that you can afford to do. So if it totally flops, you know, you're not in over your head. Yeah. What's the, what's a typical investment for that initial prototype? Um, I mean, it just depends if there's electronic components, how many mechanical things. I mean, it's a wide range, but for me, if I can make, uh, usually I'm going to try to make it myself, but if I can make something for less than two or $3,000 to get a real one in my hand, uh, I'll do that. But some of these firms will say, okay, we can do all that and it's going to be $20,000 or whatever. I'm out. You know, what I need is the 3D image of it to give the pitch. So if somebody wants to license it, then it's their problem. You know, they can do all the milling and the, you know. Yeah, to try and make it make stuff. it as as tangible as you can without plunking down that, uh, that money up front. Right. But man, it- I see people all the time spend so much money on prototypes and patents and whatever. And you see them on Shark Tank. How much time, I mean, how much money do you have invested in this? $120,000. How did you get that? I mortgaged my house and sold my great aunt, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, that was a terrible idea. You know, what if this doesn't work? And it's probably not going to. You don't have to go that far. And that's why I love the licensing thing, because all you have to have is enough to make a good sales pitch. And at least get the conversation going because the company you're pitching to has the resources you do not have. And it sounds like it's even even separate from, you know, venture capital or trying to raise investment money where maybe people are going to want to see some sort of, you know, revenue track record or, you know, some sort of customer signups like they don't on these licensing deals, they don't expect you to have sold any of these or pre-sold any of these. It's just like they're literally just buying the buying the idea and then they can you know have their engineering teams come up with a with a more precise yes yeah yeah a lot of times i mean it it helps if you have a a finished product it helps even more if you have sales um you know i I got a new board game i launched last year and at the end of the year i can i can now go i haven't approached anybody about licensing it but i can say as a side project with zero marketing dollars i sold five thousand of these last year and i did and That's pretty good, you know, preheat to the conversation because it's not just a pie in the sky idea. It helps. Where do you sell 5,000 board games? uh, Mostly (laughs) Amazon. Um, uh, That's a whole nother story. But uh, I decided last year to, I guess it was the fall of 2013 when I decided to go for it. But after licensing several games, I decided I wanted to do one myself, which was totally foolish. But I wanted to learn the process. And after a couple of licensing deals, I felt like I knew enough to be dangerous. So, uh, so I manufactured, designed it, manufactured, built everything from the ground up, had it made in China, and um, launched a new board game. And and yeah, sold five thousand of them last year by myself in time when a patient doesn't show up for their root canal. <laughs> wow, that's you're a, you're a hustler. I love it. And then yeah. and so now you can reach out to a company and say, "Okay, look, I've got this this amount of traction or something." Yeah. Yeah, but but the thing about that is like, you know, initially it was going to cost me about 5 bucks to make this game. And I sell it for 18.99. Um it's called Corked, C O R K E D. Um it has it's not a drinking game. But it's a party game, but I realized that if I was going to compete in this space that's dominated by giant companies with unlimited budgets, I had to have a unique selling proposition, and I had to sell games where no other games are sold. And so I put the game in a wine tote bag, because if you're going to a party with friends, you're probably going to be having a bottle of wine. In my head, it made sense. So it comes in a wine tote bag with a, a sleeve where you drop your bottle in and it's a party in a bag. You drop your bottle in, you go to the party and you have a party game and it's great. Well, that packaging sell it in gift shops and in wine boutiques where there were no other games. Yeah. And so Good, I did smart not packaging. I didn't go to the toy and games aisle and get slaughtered. And I would have, uh, I've tried that before. I actually had a game that made it into Barnes and Noble a couple years ago and I got crushed um, because you, you just can't compete with the, with the players that are there. So I came in the side door and I'm, I was selling them at places where no other games are being sold. And it was unique enough where people were willing to give it a try. And then after selling about a thousand of them in gift shops and wine boutiques, they go home and play with six friends they go online and try to find it. 
and it's sitting on Amazon, and then I sell another 4,000 over the course of the year um, that way. So, I mean, that's a, I guess I digress. I don't even remember what the original question was. I don't, I don't remember either, <laughs> but this is good stuff. Um, okay. But, so. Oh, what I was going to say is the reason why that was okay for me to self-produce is because it only cost $5 to make it, not $58,000 to make it, you know? So I was able to to get a thousand of them made. And even if I never sold one, I was only out five grand. Yeah. So in my head, that's okay. Because I can, if I did that, my wife wouldn't even know it. Like I, you know. Oh, I think a lot of wives out there would notice. (laughs) Well, (laughs) well, that's a whole nother thing too. But my wife, the greatest gift that she gives me is space and permission to fail. Yeah. She knows that I'll work it out. And she knows I'm not going to take dumb risk and lose money that she and my children need. Um, and so she lets me do that. And, you know, at the end of the year, I mean, she's seeing boxes come and go. And every time a truck pulls up, she knows she's going to lose her space in the carport for a couple of days. Uh, but she sees the boxes coming and going and she sees me having a good time. And so, you know, she encourages me and says, hey. This fun stuff. Go for it. You know, yeah, so. definitely. I like to think of, of those kind of investments as a percentage of net worth. So yeah. it's like if you're looking at a five grand investment, you, you know, it's, it's easier to look at it as like, well, that's five thousand dollars. What else can I do with that? But it's like if you have a net worth of one hundred thousand dollars, it's like, does it make sense to put five percent of wealth for this idea that could pay back, you know, triple or, or quadruple, you know? Yeah. And, and everything's cumulative, you know, I mean. I don't know what my first entrepreneurial project was, um, but I was probably 10 or 12 years old or something. But, you know, I've always kind of added and and you take the earnings from one and you parlay it into something else and you keep going. And eventually that side account builds enough to where you have some space to work with. But it takes time. I mean, the Mattel thing we talked about at the beginning of the show, it's a long shot. That's not going to happen. I mean, you know... Everything else is slow, steady growth and, and, you know, pivoting, regrouping, making something new, learning something every time and just keep adding to that basket. And uh, eventually it really becomes something after 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. One, one idea at one pitch at a time. Um, Nate, thanks so much for, for joining me and, and sharing all this stuff. So we, to try and recap, we talked all about, um, you know, idea generation, maybe pivoting on something that's already out there or, you know, looking at your, you know, your, your job role, your, your, uh, hobbies. If there's something that like, Oh, I just wish there was something else or, you know, what your friends are saying, wouldn't it be great if you, if there was just something that could do well, why, why not? Why not you, um, some LinkedIn hacks to get that going, uh, how to protect your idea as best you can. Um, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff going on in, in this episode. So thank you so much for joining everyone. It's natedallas.com if you want to check them out. You can catch me on Twitter too. Uh, my handle is Father's Brother, capital F, capital B. My, my brother is a Roman Catholic priest. So I am Father's Brother um, on Twitter if you want to. I'm glad, I'm glad you <laughs> explained that because I was like, that would be uncle. <laughs> yeah. Like I was, I was yeah, right. About. right. Well, it's funny. People introduce me all the time. Like this is father's brother. But, um, <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the best way to get me an actual message is, is on LinkedIn. If you, if you hit me and send me an invite, I will accept it. And then you can send me a direct message or whatever. Um, I love to share and help any way I can. So, uh, don't hesitate to hit me up if you've got a question or something I can, maybe help you with, or maybe you can just mooch off of my contacts. Awesome. We will, <laughs> we will link you up to Father's Brother and Nate on LinkedIn, and we'll, we'll wrap it up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. My number one tip, I think, is just to be honest with who you are and be courageous. Um, no one needs to understand you. No one needs to understand your project, but do what you feel like you've been designed to do and don't shortchange yourself um, by doing what everybody else is doing. So whatever it is that you're passionate about and you think you have a talent to do or what God has designed you to do, don't ask for anybody else's permission. Just be honest and be courageous and have a good time doing it. I like it. Don't don't shortchange yourself. It reminds me of uh, John Acuff saying, you know, average is living a life, life less than you're capable of. Really good stuff. Yeah. 
All right, Nate, thanks so much. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks. How about that? What do you think? If you got some ideas kicking around in your head that that might be worth a shot at licensing, um, I'm going to start writing these things down as they come in because I I get them and I, I'm like, well, I'm, not, I'm never going to have time to execute on that, so I'll just put it aside. But this seems like the perfect side hustle because you know, you, if you know you're not going to have time to to actually take action on something, you know, maybe maybe somebody else could, maybe some big company could, and they could pay you for that. That's, I'm, I got kind of excited about this one. Um, anyways, <laughs> this edition of the Side Hustle Show is uh, brought to you by Audible.com. Start your uh, 30-day free trial and listen to your first audiobook for free at SideHustleNation.com slash Audible. Uh, maybe a little something about product licensing. Uh, I know Nate said his books were, were outdated, so I linked one uh, up in the show notes called One Simple Idea that uh, that is available on Audible if you want to check that one out. SideHustleNation.com slash Audible to get your first audiobook for free and start your 30-day free trial. All my notes and highlights from this episode plus Nate's top product licensing tips are available in a free downloadable PDF for you at SideHustleNation.com slash 99 or through the link in the episode description of your podcast player app. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll see you next week in episode 100. It'll be a fun one. So don't be sure, be sure not to miss it. Until then, hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com.